Um, so I'm Gail Trotter. And today is our um, fall kickoff meeting. And part of the kicking off probably be a lot about learning about using Zoom. So um, just note that we're all sort of in a learning curve on this. And um, the, um, I first want to start with uh, acknowledging that the South Sound chapter is on Coast Salish land um, in the territorial, um, traditional territorial area of Coast Salish land. Solish, Salish land. And um, what I thought would be fun is a little breaker or uh, introduction thing is if you know uh, of the, um, the tribe that's closest to you, if you want to enter that in the chat, and if you happen to know a plant that they are, uh, that's very useful to them or that they care a lot about, just, just name one. Um, go ahead and put that in the chat too. That'd be a fun way to see the range of areas that we're in. And um, so our kickoff usually is outdoors. I, I was thinking that it was pretty much that we're not going to be able to do that because of the smoke. But there's been other reasons why we couldn't have an uh, um, in-person outdoor meeting. But um, we are thinking about doing some hikes for uh, October. So be uh, a hike for October. So watch for that in the newsletter, in the newsletter update. And we will um, uh, start getting those established where we can utilize those. And for um, October, I'm just gonna announce ahead of time the October. And October, our uh, program will be about um, uh, making your backyard a bird haven. And Kim Adelson from um, the uh, Black Hills Audubon will be presenting. So that should be a fun opportunity. So good, we're seeing lots of pla pla places and plants that people um, know about their, um, of their re regional or territory areas. The, the, very cool. Thank you all for sharing. That is fun. Um, so the way that tonight's going to work, um, I'll talk about that a little too. Um, we're going to uh, have our presenter do his pre presentation right off for first. And then um, we will um, take a time where we open up uh, and you guys will all be able to talk and share um, just because we haven't met together for a while. Um, so... Uh, we'll be probably doing that format for a while and um, just, you know, help us. If you have thoughts or ways that you think that we could improve on the Zoom sessions, please um, do let me know. I'll put that in the next newsletter too, that you'll be able to send us some ideas of things that would be help for improvement. This is fun to see all these um, see all the chat items coming in or all the locations and um, the plants. So cool. Thank you. Well, our uh, speaker tonight is um, Bob uh, Vados. And I was, um, I was wanting to do something around um, the Coast Salish Sea or the, or the Salish Sea or, and the plants that are around there. And I we had a tabling event at the estuarium here in Olympia. And so I asked there, is, is, was there a speaker there? And they got me in touch with Bob. And it turns out Bob has been a member since 2018 of the South Sound chapter. So tonight we're gonna to have a member share, which is very cool. But he is also um, a, um, He's, he works for the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. 
and their uh, habitat program. And he has quite a bit of a background in um, estuaries and the wetlands. Uh, and he um, does volunteer with the South Sound Estuary Association. And um, he also volunteers uh, with, well, he's a, a, a part of the Surfrider Foundation, which does a lot of um, coastal cleanup, uh, cleanups, beach cleanups. And so that really shows that Bob is very active in um, many of the things that we value in the Native Plant Society of being active in conservation um, and uh, also um, sharing uh, that. So I really appreciate Bob coming. Bob, would you like to come in now? He's ready. Which means I think you have to share your screen. Yep, I do. Um, let me share the screen. Let's see. Share the screen. Let's see. All right. And let me get me in there. Let's see. Oops. Hold on. Uh oh. One second. Looks like I got to put me in first. All right, and now I think I could share the screen and it should work. Okay. There we go. Okay. Should I proceed? Yes, please do. And um, Bob will stop along the way uh, where you can put uh, questions in the chat and we'll monitor that and then we'll have more time for questions at the end. Okay, thank you. Um, anyway, uh, this talk uh, came about a just a, a little bit, of, I have worked with uh, the two groups that you mentioned in the past and also with uh, the Squally Reach Nature Center, but um, at, the, at the present time, I'm sort of uh, uh, freelance, shall, you say, shall I say, and, uh, um, and, uh, but I will say a little more about these and other uh, marine related groups in a, in a slide a uh, little bit later here. Anyway, I've been with uh, the state uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife for uh, just almost 20 years now. Um, and um, mostly I work on freshwater stuff, uh, particularly salmon and uh, um, trout. And uh, more recently, uh, have expanded a little bit into the marine realm and uh, other issues like riparian and culverts. And there's a lot of different things going on. And, and some of these, um, uh, have our freshwater, some actually have a marine app or at least estuary applications as well. Uh, one project that I'm working on deals with uh, marine hydrokinetics, you know, the some of the um, tidal and wave power um, energy uh, devices that have been proposed in Washington and elsewhere along the Pacific coast. And uh, so uh, over the years, I've more my experience has been more with um, uh, freshwater. I've done marine stuff in different states. I'll make a. I'll have a slide of that in a minute. I, I do want to say that my father is is the seaweed expert. I, in some sense, I've uh, uh, have done some vicarious learning off him as a professor emeritus at the University of Maine in Orono, uh, and. Uh, Originally, this slideshow was uh, made by Sandy uh, Ziner for, uh, for uh, Puget Sound Estuarium presentation uh, for training uh, naturalists about um, the macro plants, as I call them. And, uh, and then when she couldn't do it, I took it over and, uh, and I guess she recommended me for the talk today. So thank you for that. And uh, let me proceed. Oh, one little note. I'm not gonna talk about state policy, but if I get questions about it, please realize that things that I say will uh, be my own opinion on that. And uh, so, uh, but uh, as I say, mostly I'm just focusing on the biology here. Let's see. Oh, let's see, so how do I get page down now? Oh, there we go. And Bob, uh, if you uh, could. Yes? Go ahead and start your slideshow, so your full screen. 
Oh, yes. Um, yeah, let me get that. Yeah. Okay, slideshow, set up slideshow. Ah, there it is. Let's see. No, that didn't seem to work. Let's see. Hmm. Uh, Click from the beginning on the far left. From beginning. Beginning. Oh, from beginning. Okay. Ah, okay. Thank you. All right. So has everybody seen the slide already? We're seeing the cover slide. Thank you, Bob. All right. Okay. Um, that website, by the way, just has some items, books, et cetera, that people might be interested to learn more about marine plants and animals. Um, I'll make, after the talk, I'll make this presentation available. So, you don't, people don't need to fierce, fiercely take notes because it'll be available. Um, anyway, uh, hmm, let me see if I can move. In terms of uh, my marine biology experience, uh, I mentioned a little bit uh, throughout the years. Um, I did, I was, before I came to Washington State, um, almost 20 years ago, I was working in Florida with the, their Marine Research Institute there. Um, in the past, I worked a little bit with the feds and uh, academia. Um, and uh, most, all these, uh, the photos that I show are all gonna be in the South Sound area. So, you, and uh, I'm suspecting people will recognize where many of these are. Anyway, uh, let's move on. <clears throat> so I mentioned some of the NGOs and, uh, and they, a lot of them have different flavors. Uh, and I've, I've dealt with all these in the past, but uh, the South Sound Estuary Association, Association or the Estuarium has an educational focus. That's um, some of the other groups such as uh, Surf Riders that was mentioned and the Shoots Estuary Restoration Team they do both. They also do advocacy. Um, and then the Squality Nature uh, Reach Nature Center does that and also actually does research. And uh, I had many, some years ago, I had been involved with their forage fish egg surveying work. So uh, these are uh, some of the hobbies I've done over the years. <clears throat> so let's move into. Um, um, just trying to figure out how to get the, my picture out of the way there. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so, <clears throat> so ecologic or the kind of the seaweed values um, are many and uh, um, they can be found in both the sub and intertidal zones. The subtidal zone is always, most always wetted. The intertidal zones, of course, can be uh, dry up at uh, low tides. Um, the, uh, the, the, the seaweeds also serve as good environmental indicators and I, and I should add the, you know, the seagrasses as well um, for uh, how much wave action, what kind of uh, bed, whether rocky or fine, uh, how deep, uh, pollution tolerance, and uh, there's, there's a, they often have a, a mix, complex mix of the two life cycles, sporo and gametophytes, which are um, asexual versus sexual reproduction, respectively. And so uh, they're very, uh, very interesting to study for that reason. Um, they serve as habitat and food re uh, resources for many other uh, plants and animals, uh, contributing particularly to the detrital food chain in uh, Puget Sound. Um, by slowing um, <clears throat> the velocity down, they uh, Oftentimes plankton are harbored among those. That's an added food resource that you can often find in uh, seagrass or uh, kelp beds. Um, and a, kind of a new finding that uh, the Department of Natural Resources has been looking at is uh, uh, the protection in eelgrass beds, particularly for uh, calcareous biota, like shellfishes, for example. And as, and as many you know, or may know now, um, the ocean acidification is um, reducing shell thickness um, and which is really now hurting the oyster industry. Um, but uh, there looks like within the, out, uh, the eelgrass beds because of the photosynthesis uh, and all, the, uh, these uh, 
these shellfishes may well get some protection, which is definitely encouraging. Um, <clears throat> and actually, calcareous biota will also include a, a coral and algae, which I'll mention a little bit later. Um, so here's what low tide looks like. That's a really good time to look for algae and, and other things, uh, animals as well. Um, so some of the other uses that you see for these things, you find them in foods and other household products like toothpaste, et cetera. Um, and so they, uh, they do serve, uh, algae do serve a lot of um, functions and, uh, and they're also used in the medical and environmental mitigation industries and uh, even as a source of biofuel more recently. So there's a lot of things, uh, uses. <clears throat> Real quickly, uh, if you've ever seen the giant sea anemone and wonder why it's green, well, it's sort of like coral in that it uh, has uh, unicellular or green algae inside. And, um, and, uh, and uh, so it's kind of a symbiotic relationship. They both benefit. And in uh, any case, I'm not going to say much more about unicellular plants today, mostly as I am focusing on the macro plants, but I thought this would be an interesting uh, little uh, thing, to, kind of an interesting note. Here are some guides that are good for seaweeds and uh, seagrasses in Puget Sound. And, uh, and they're, they both are in laminated form, so you can bring them out with you on the beach. Um, two recent publications that uh, you might find interesting. Um, and I'm just, I just got this Islin uh, book the other day from REI in West Olympia, kind of just browsing and saying, hey, this looks kind of cool, but I haven't got real far into it yet, but that may be something that you might want to look at. Uh, the Steel Quest uh, book uh, has been around for a few years now, really good guide to the, uh, the animals and plant life, you know, along our coast. And, uh, and so you can learn some more there. Um, so let's get into the seaweed uh, morphology. And again, these are the macroalgae. These are multicellular. And so they're a little bit higher in the evolutionary chain than the phytoplankton. As you can see, there's uh, the blades, the floats, dipe, and holdfast. Holdfasts are not really roots. They don't absorb nutrients like land plants, but they do keep them from uh, um, getting knocked around too much, except during big storms. Um, in any case, uh, the, uh, what tends to happen with the seaweeds is they, they, during winter, the blades tend to dry up and, uh, and basically the, ho the holdfast and stipe are left over the winter and then they grow back. So they, uh, they, uh, they uh, do a lot less photosynthesis in, in winter. <clears throat> There are about 600 seaweed species in Puget Sound, and we're going to mention every single one. No, not really. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, so there's quite a bit of diversity here. Um, the zonation of seaweeds tends to be uh, similar to, as you see on the Atlantic coast, and, uh, and uh, they, the depth preferences actually reflect different, uh, you know, photosynthetic pigments, uh, depending on what uh, colors are effective at different depths. And uh, please note that, you know, if you're walking along the beach, you're likely to see all of these, even the deeper red algae, because they get washed up. And so you can find them on the beach or in the rack line. And uh, anyway, uh, the red algae tend to be uh, deepest, and that includes the coral and algae um, that live on rocks. And uh, the uh, brown algae are a little bit shallower and they include kelp, which uh, the kelp beds are very important for fish and wildlife, including waterfowl and uh, shellfishes. And there's so many things that live in, in these kelp beds. <clears throat> the green algae uh, tend to be the closest to shore and uh, they are the ones um, from which land plants evolved. So uh, they are uh, very important in the evolutionary uh, uh, history. And uh, please note that they don't tend to provide year-round photosynthesis, and less so, I should say, than the flowering plants like seagrasses. Um, but uh, um, 
not all, uh, Celts, for example, are perennial species, but they do tend to, like I mentioned, dive back to their uh, holdfasts and stipes in the winter. <clears throat> uh, let's move on to the red algae or the rhodophytes. Uh, here's, I'm gonna go through specimens that tend to be in the South Sound. Uh, there's so much more as you get to the outer coast and also up into the uh, northern parts of Puget Sound where there are more currents and there's more rock and stuff. You're gonna get other species as well, but let's focus on what's you know in our immediate area. And, uh, but of course, I, um, if you have questions about some of these others that I don't mention, please bring them up. Uh, anyway, there's the Turkish washcloth and Turkish towel, both of which have papillae, these little bumps on them. Um, the washcloth tends to be smaller than the, the towel. And, uh, and so these are uh, <clears throat> red algae that you're likely to see. Um, sea laurel actually has cartilag cartilaginous, that's a hard one to say, branches, which cartilage is as you may know, includes what's in our nose and in our ears. And uh, so it makes it stronger. Um, the delicate sea lace is often epiphytic, which means that it tends to grow on other uh, uh, marine plants. And so uh, and I'll have more to say about epiphytes a little bit later. Um, filamentous uh, seaweeds, the red string um, are uh, prominent and most of us probably have eaten nori or purple lava. Um, it, it's the seaweed that uh, even though it, it tends to look uh, kind of reddish alive, um, once it gets dried and cooked and all it, it looks black and it's on sushi and and other uh, seafood items and you can buy it just plain in the store, grocery stores. <clears throat> and uh, so it, it's pretty thin, um, and uh, um, let's move on to sea noodles, another one that's edible. And while I'm talking about edibility, the, the red algae in general tend to be very tasty uh, uh, to eat. They're very delicate, and because of that being delicate in texture, they tend to, they are vulnerable to what's called red rot disease, um, but uh, We've not had major problems on that on the Pacific coast so far. I already mentioned the coralline algae or crustose coralline algae. They're a little deeper and you're less likely to see them walking around uh, along the shore, but I wanted to mention them because they are important part of the uh, marine habitat. Uh, let's move on to brown. Um, oh, before I move on, let me uh, check for questions, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. So you guys can like just enter your questions in the chat and Oh, um, also the Q and A, which I'm supposed to also check. Okay, two in the Q&A. Okay, in the Q&A there's a question, how many marine flowering plants are there in the Puget Sound? Oh, um, well, I'll be getting to that a little later, but the prominent ones that we have down here are the uh, eel, the native and the uh, exotic eel grasses. Um, as you get farther up, you also get the surf grasses. Um, and I don't know offhand the question to how many species there are, but um, my educated guess is it's probably about a dozen. I'm just, let me grab something here to see if I can say something a little more definitive on that. Let's see. Uh, hmm. Let's see. What do we got? Hmm. Yeah, probably, do, probably about a dozen um, all, uh, are coming into play. I'll say a little bit about more of cord grass later, which is also in there. Um, the surf grasses tend to be in the faster water kind of uh, than we have down here, but 
Yeah, that, that's an approximate. I'll, I'll have to check on that and get back to you guys and probably uh, add that information in because I uh, don't have an I don't have an approximate number other than about a dozen. Great. And then the, the second question is, and I'm not going to say it properly. Uh, it uh -huh. says, "What is the function of the papillae? Something P P A P A P I L L A E." Oh, the papillae. Oh, right. Oh. Uh, let's go. Oh, yeah. The, um, they. That's a good question. I think they probably provide a little bit of flotation, but um, um, that one I'm going to have to check on. Just keep in mind that um, that um, you, you may stump me a few times here today because I am not a seaweed biologist per se, but um, I think they do provide a little flotation, but I'll have to, let me get back to you guys on that one too. Okay, uh, and then I have a couple more here. Um, uh -huh. So uh, of the plants you've talked about so far, the algae and whatnot, um, how are they holding up as from an environmental aspect? Um, a lot of, uh, huh, well, some are doing better than others. Um, and I'll be getting into some of, the, uh, some of the species that aren't doing as well, like bull kelp in a, in a little later in the talk and the eel grasses, for example, are native eel grasses that are been in decline. And those are the most important species for providing uh, cover for uh, uh, fish and wildlife. And, uh, but uh, let me get into that one a little later in more detail. But a lot of these other species, um, including green algae, are doing pretty well. And I'll have, I'll have more to say about that a little later too. Uh, but uh, in general, um, you know, they're not showing the kind of declines that you're seeing at the higher trophic levels. Right. Um, the red algae are different chemically. I think they have omega fatty acids. Are they a source for fish oils, rich richness in fatty acids? Um, I, you know, more, more of what the seaweeds are, are known for are their um, vitamins and uh, micronutrients. Um, I have not heard of them being a good source of fatty oils. Um, they may have some, but I'll have to get back to you on that one too. Uh, that's a good question. But if you really, for the fatty oils, the better sources and the ones that are available commercially are, um, you know, tend to be uh, fish oriented, such, you know, it, you know, salmon or cod or even, well, for invertebrates, krill, for example, is a good source of the fatty oils. I have not heard of a commercial source of, that's using seaweeds as the fatty oil source. But, but for those that are, um, for those that are vegetarians, I can understand that, uh, that question and I will, let me get back to you on that one. Okay, sounds great. All right, huh? you can keep going. All righty, let's go back to the, start with the brown, back to the brown algae. Um, so the brown algae, as I mentioned, tend to be a little shallower and some of them are intertidal. Um, the sea cauliflower looks sort of like cauliflower and, uh, and uh, that certainly uh, provides a bit of flotation as does with the rockweed uh, the uh, vesicles that it has. Um, the, uh, it's important for these plants to be able to float to some extent, you know, even though they're, they're tied down on their holdfasts, they want to float up in the water column to get more uh, photosynthesis. And so a lot of these um, seaweeds do have devices for flotation and, uh, and sometimes during their uh, chemical process, they even, they, you know, certainly with photosynthesis, they're producing oxygen, but some of them even also produce carbon monoxide of all things. So, uh, you know, these, uh, these vesicles will tend to have these gases inside that help them float. So um, anyway, um, the rockweed is one that 
we see a lot of in the South Sound. Mm. Uh, we also have uh, some of the more psychedelic, so quote, not really, but um, the uh, brown algae, uh, such as the flattened acid kelp or the witch's hair. Um, these ones, I wouldn't suggest trying to eat. They're not going to be tasty. Uh, a lot of the brown algae are, like the kelps and, and things, but uh, not these. And uh, another one that you probably, I didn't put a slide for, but another one that I wouldn't suggest eating would be the bleach weed, which is named quite mnemonically, shall we say. So um, some are better than others. <clears throat> uh, soda straws definitely look like soda straws. Um, and uh, they're definitely, I've seen them around here. And uh, you'll definitely see the exotic sargassum, um, which is a different species than is found in the Sargasso Sea on the Atlantic coast, which is, for those uh, that are, know, uh, that's where the eels from both Europe and uh, are the North Atlantic or the Atlantic coast um, on, uh, for North America. Uh, that's where they spawn. Um, on the Pacific coast, they haven't actually uh, figured out if, uh, if, the, uh, <clears throat> if the eels that we have out here spawn in sar or sargassum, but maybe at some point the, the biologists will, uh, fish biologists will figure that out. But here in the uh, South Sound, they have increased their abundance. They are, back to that, somebody asked the question about impacts. They are impacting some of the native species. Um, I don't know how well that's been quantified, but it is certainly a concern because they are exotic and invasive. And, uh, uh, and as you can see, they, they're, they're also called wireweed because they kind of are wiry. And uh, so it's a, it's a species of concern that we may hear more about in the future. Uh, Back to, let's get into some of the kelps a little bit. Two common, or well, a common one that you'll see in Puget Sound and is also edible is the sugar kelp. Um, they, they have mannitol sugar in them, which uh, contributes to their taste. Um, as you can see, they have a short uh, stipe in contrast to the bull kelp, which has a long stipe. Um, it looks sort of like a bull whip, which is where it got its name. The bull kelp, we don't see much down here. Um, they have been on the decline. Um, in general, like I already mentioned that um, the bull kelp um, is one of the bigger kelps. They tend to be in deep water and hence can get up to 100 feet long. And uh, although here in Puget Sound where it's shallower, um, you're not gonna probably see them much more than 20 feet long. And, uh, but uh, <clears throat> kelps like this, have become more rare from human packs because they are sensitive. Um, and, but these, as I mentioned, are very important habitat for a lot of other species. So when these start declining, so does the whole suite of species. So these uh, Department of Natural Resources is monitoring some of the bigger kelps like the bull. And uh, for that reason, uh, they're trying to uh, come up with restoration projects. So anyway, uh, if you see, if you see bull kelp in the South Sound, the Department of Natural Resources would probably like to hear from you. Uh, Helen Bear Barry is a good person to talk to about that um, in that department. And so this is one that is a kind of a, shall we say, it's kind of a sentinel species, if you will, that its decline is reflective of a general problem in Puget Sound. <clears throat> Uh, moving on a little more with the kelp beds into key, the keystone species concept. Um, many of you may have heard about the sea otters and how they, that when they were harvested many uh, moons ago, um, their fur, um, what ended up happening is the kelp beds started declining because the sea urchins became more abundant. Sea otters, that's one of their important uh, diet components. And so when uh, the, the sea urchins were over harvested and, and uh, pretty much extirpated from the Pacific coast, um, the kelp beds declined too, which is very serious. Fortunately now, we do have sea otters again um, 
not throughout the Pacific coast, but we do have them in the, um, on the northern part of the Washington coast. Um, there's, there's some in California as well. Oregon still doesn't have them back. So that's still a restoration recovery process in progress, but uh, uh, the fact that we have the sea otters back is definitely a good sign for helping rest restore kelp beds. Although that, as I, as I kind of hinted at, that's the only, not the only reason that kelp beds have declined. Uh, other reasons, you know, have included, you know, just uh, impacts from, you know, boats, you know, going through and uh, ripping them up, uh, pollution, and uh, so there's a lot of different things that are uh, hurting kelp beds, but it's nice that with sea otters back, we are getting some restra restoration just from that, although we are also trying to make progress on some of the other fronts too. Uh, anyway, sea, sea urchins are interesting. They, uh, they, uh, they can actually eat through the stipes of uh, kelp. And uh, because of that, you know, once the, uh, they eat away at that and the kelp gets blown away, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not functioning you know, as part of uh, the kelp beds and the, or the kelp forest, shall, shall I say, in some sense, they help clear cut those, uh, those kelp beds and, and those are called sea urchin barrens. So it makes a big difference. So when I, so the sea otter is definitely a keystone species. Um, you may have also heard another keystone, uh, well, set of species are starfishes here on the Pacific coast. Um, and, uh, the uh, southern resident orcas have been called a, uh, or well, all the salmon eating orcas have been called a, a keystone species as well because their decline in the ecosystem um, means that a lot of other things can go wrong. Um, and so they have cascading effects. And uh, so one of the things, you know, in the past, a lot of the ecological studies that had been done were based on single species concepts of and what we're finding with everything connected to everything else and some species, the keystone species in particular, having disproportionate effects on ecosystem structure and function, um, we, uh, we're finding that impacts, we've under predicted impacts because of this not recognizing the keystone concept. So this is one that will hopefully get more attention in the future. It certainly has in the ecological field but it really needs more uh, emphasis in the, in the uh, applied ecology field as well, including, uh, you know, what, um, you know, the management of the, our marine resources. So anyway, um, let's go through green algae and then I'll stop again. Um, the chlorophytes, oh, I should have pronounced real quick. The phaophytes are the brown algae, some of these, uh, uh, I think Latin name probably. Um, but anyway, the, uh, the green string lettuce is one that you're going to see around and ulva is one that's really abundant around here. Uh, if you go to any beach during the summer, you can, you see them all over the place. They are so thin because they are only one to two cell layers thick. So they're, that's why, you know, they're translucent and, uh, um, um, but even though they're delicate, there are many ways they're not delicate. And what I mean by that is the next slide. Um, these, uh, both these genera tolerate uh, freshwater inputs. You can find them, um, you know, near leaky septic systems, groundwater seeps. Groundwater seeps, by the way, are important for fish spawning, for forage fish spawning. So, uh, if you see them, that might also be a sign that it might be a good place for the forage fishes to spawning, such as uh, sand lance and surf smelt. Um, they're also found in creeks like uh, Sequalitu um, in the Nisqually Reach, the pond area. And that's just a picture of its estuary there. But uh, um, anyway, one of some of those early pictures that I showed um, in my slideshow were all the all over the place. and. Uh, and I think they will, both those pictures I did take um, at the mouth of uh, Polichu Creek. So anyway, ALVA is a thermally and pollution tolerance 
um, set of species. These guys are going to be found, for example, around STPs, the sewage treatment plants, and uh, and uh, one of uh, uh, South Sound WNPS members, uh, bon um, Bonnie Blessing Earl, has done a little study in the uh, Seattle area that looked like that sh that seemed to show the effect that the isotope ratios for nitrogen vary whether or not uh, these plants are near uh, STPs. So maybe there's some sort of adaptive process going on there or something. But in any case, um, these are the more pollution tolerant species. Uh, back a little bit to that question earlier, when I said some species are doing very well, um, this would be one of them. They, 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 will, they will kind of become more prominent where there's pollution just because they can handle it better than a lot of other species or set of species. So um, anyway, that's that. And let me stop again for questions before I move on to the flowering plants. Great, so um, there's a question that says, uh, do near shore structures like uh, bulkheads influence marine algae? I've noticed that bulkheads turn sandy beaches into rocky. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Too bad for the landowners who want sand. Are the seaweeds safe if the marine toxins are present? And then there's more questions. Do they concentrate or release toxins? Um, okay. Okay. It seems like I, I, I'll, I see there's three parts that I got there, and let me go through that. If I missed anything, let me know. But okay. um, certainly docks and, and any types of overwater structures in Puget Sound is a controversial subject. And, uh, and it is something that's under big management scrutiny right now. Um, and, uh, you know, they do, pro the docks provide shading. You're not going to find a lot of these things under them um, for that reason. Um, some will grow on the edges of them, you know, because they they kind of provide a substrate for them. But uh, underneath, no, you're probably not going to see them. Um, and, uh, you know, as we get more and more people in Puget Sound, this is becoming a bigger issue. Uh, but uh, as I said, it's being studied. Um, um, and, uh, okay, but uh, I, I may be able to say more about that later. I was cautioned by my superiors not to say too much about it, just because this is a policy issue, and uh, and I and I I, uh, I have some personal opinions on it. But uh, but I will say it, it's something that we're probably going to see some management changes on in the coming years, most likely. Um, the uh, moving on to the pollution part of it. Um, they uh, they do tend they can accumulate uh, pollutants a little bit. They're not like mosses that you know really soak everything up. They're they're certainly not like uh, shellfishes that that really uh, soak all these toxins up. Not to the same degree, um, but uh, they can um, they can they are subject to. Remember, I mentioned that the red algae are subject to red rot disease and in getting onto the uh, flowering uh, seagrasses like eelgrass um, that, that are subject to wasting disease as well. So, and some of these seem to be pollution related. Um, and uh, I don't think I answered all the parts of the question. Uh, let's see. Um, it was, so, so on the toxins, it was, are seaweeds safe um, um, if the marine toxins are present and then and the second one, which just bumped away, um, where did yeah. it go? Um, wait, wait, wait. Uh, and um, do they release toxins? Yeah. Um, not, I don't, I'm not aware that they're releasing toxins. They're not really building them up, to be honest. Um, they don't, I don't. I'll have to make sure on that, but I don't think you have, you'd have to worry too much about them with red tide, certainly not to the same extent that you would with shellfishes. 
Um, but let me, I'm going to check into that a little more because I don't want to give anybody some false hopes. But in general, if you're going to like harvest these, which you need a DNR license to do, um, I would definitely suggest in less polluted areas. Um, and here in the South Sound, this is not really maybe the best place to harvest them. Although if you get up towards the Nisqually Reach where it's a little less polluted, I would certainly recommend that. <laughs> I would not recommend harvesting in Bud Inlet, for example, uh, though it's a little less polluted towards the outer edges of it. But um, as you uh, as you get farther away, farther north in Puget Sound or on the outer coast where there's a little more wave action and and pollute in it, and there's less pollutants with less population density, and also with the more currents and stuff, uh, it tends to uh, move. Uh, things aren't as stagnant, the pollutants don't tend to build up as much, but, um, you know, they, you will, you know, even if, even though they, 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 they're, they're, they're not going to bioaccumulate in these plants, they probably are going to at least absorb some of it. Um, a lot of these plants have epiphytes on them, or they, and sometimes they may even have little animals on them, epifauna. Um, and so for that reason, um, <clears throat> they can, uh, some of the things that grow on them may be accumulating them. So if you were going to eat them, you might want to um, clean it first. Um, in general, if you're going to eat uh, sea, uh, seaweeds, um, it's recommended that you do it early in the spring before, uh, you know, the major toxin inputs um, the pollution becomes worse. Um, it's also recommended that you soak them a little bit in fresh water, which, uh, you know, it can clean it up a little bit. also makes it a little less salty for people that don't like a real salty taste. So um, so if I were going to harvest in this area, I would, I would go to the Nisqually Reach. It's a little cleaner there, but even better, I, a, a good place that I visited this, this, this summer um, where I would definitely feel more safe would be up in the Dungeness area at the wildlife refuge there. Um, that's a great place to look for a lot of different types of seaweeds on the, on the Dungeness spit, for example. Um, those are the best places to harvest. But um, again, if you are going to harvest down, you know, farther south in Puget Sound, I would restrict it to early spring. And okay, I so there's another question on harvesting. Okay. Um, is uh, local harvesting having any impact on our seaweed beds? Um, it probably is to some extent. Um, I don't know if it's been studied just in the South Sound, but in general, it, it's considered one of the impacts for seaweed reductions, yes. Um, I don't know if there's any, been any uh, um, studies that really have quantified how much, but between that harvesting and the pollution and uh, some of the foreign invaders like the uh, sargassum that I mentioned, the brown seaweed, uh, they're probably all having impacts. I don't think it's been quantified what the relative importance of those are at this point. Okay, um, are there seaweed which help with erosion? Um, the seaweeds tend to grow on rocks and so no, but the ones that do, I guess, coming into the flowering plants, the answer is yes, they do help with erosion because they do tend to grow on softer beds. Um, you know, some of the, some of the uh, seaweeds do grow, like alva, for example, can grow on soft bottoms. And so they, you know, they might provide a little bit of uh, erosion control, but the ones that are really good at that are going to be the seagrasses. Should I move into that one, or is there more? Are there more questions? Um, I've got uh, two more questions. Uh huh. Um, uh, one is uh, you mentioned some books, uh, but they were looking. This uh, question is about if there's any books that are for the northern regions, like in, up in BC, or. Um, uh, you know. Well, the ones that I, I showed a slide that had a. Uh, let me go back to that real quick. There's probably a more elegant way to do this, but in any case, uh, where was it? There it is. 
the field guide to the seaweeds of the Pacific Northwest, that researcher, I believe, is actually from British Columbia. And, uh, um, but uh, I mean, a lot of what we have here, they have there too, because um, we all are part of the Salish Sea, at least, well, for the southern part of British Columbia. But, um, but as I mentioned, as you get farther north, including into British Columbia, you're going to see more of the um, wave tolerant uh, seaweeds and uh, seagrasses. Um, a good example of a, a brown seaweed that you're going to see, you're not going to see so much down here, but you'll, you'll see up there is if, for those that have heard of the sea palm. I didn't put a photo in, but the sea palm really is one that's kind of like surf grasses on the for the flowering plant side of things. Those are the ones that you're going to see in faster water. You're going to see more commonly in British Columbia and in, in the, along the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Uh, there's others, there's a whole slew of, um, of other types of brown seaweeds that you know, you're going to see in some of these faster velocity areas, including in British Columbia, like the feather boa, which I don't have a, I didn't provide a photo of, but that's one that uh, is kind of a, interesting looking uh, brown seaweed. And so, you know, we only have part of the diversity down here because we have, you know, the slower currents, the more stagnation and stuff. And, uh, but as you get up there, the currents are stronger and you will see a lot higher diversity, yes. Okay, so um, uh, let's see, there's two more. Um, and I'm just going to make a, one. One is just going to be a comment that I got. Um, just okay. About clarification um, that you can't come, you cannot collect or harvest any plants or animals from the National Wildlife Refuge. And so, so oh, the no, yeah. the Swally yeah, Reach yeah. or what or wherever that boundary is, you you can't do that. So, uh, but then okay. Um, just uh, with the Squally Reach, not all uh, like for example, if you would, if you hike down the Squally to Trail Trail Creek, that's not within the wildlife refuge. And uh, yeah, it's okay if you if you're out there. When I mentioned the Dungeness Spit, for example, that you know if you just like pick up a little bit and just taste it, that's that's different. You don't need a license for that, but. Yeah, for collecting, yeah, that's a good point though. If you're actually collecting with a harvesting license, it, it, yeah, you do. it's not gonna be in a park, no. Okay. Um, okay. Although and I'm not sure about state parks. State parks might be different because you, um, you can harvest clams in our state parks. So that one, um, that one I, I, I have to make sure on that, but I think that's, it's, national is different, but state parks, you might be able to harvest. I, I'll have to check on that though. Okay, so here's now one, there, one there, where I'll probably mispronounce it. Uh -huh. um, and I will spell it to you if it doesn't make sense. Um, okay. Are endophytic fungi involved with algae and how important are they? Do you want me to spell that word that I couldn't No, say no, no, I, okay. I, have, I have not heard of that. Um, I'd be curious to know more about it if, if the speaker or sorry, the uh, participant has information on that, but I, I can look, I can look, uh, I can check on that, but I've not heard anything about that. Uh, you know, I, 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 I had, you know, we keep in mind that land plants with roots and have mycorrhizae, but in the sea, we're not talking about that with seaweed. They ju it's just hold fast. On the other hand, the flowering plants, which I haven't got into yet, do actually have roots, but I have not heard of that because, um, you know, fungi are not, don't tend to be real salt tolerant. So uh, I'd, I'm, I'm leaning away from it, but I will check on that. Yeah. Okay, great. So I think you can go on. We, I think that covers right. most of them. Okay, oops. All right, well, let's move to the flowering plants. So here's the thing. I mentioned earlier that the green algae helped bring the evolution of land plants. But then some of the plants came back to the sea. So it's a little bit of a homecoming of sorts. And these are the, uh, include the seagrasses. And so these plants actually do set seed and the seeds, you know, fall in the water and fall in the bottom and, and uh, take seed just like uh, can happen on the land. So uh, 
Um, <clears throat> so the uh, um, the native eelgrass that I is the certainly our most prominent one here in the South Sound, or well used to be. It's not so much anymore. Um, the uh, up the area that's been the most have the highest densities of the native eelgrass have been uh, the Skagit area, the North Sound. Um, but uh, we do have some down here in such places as in the Nisqually and Steamboat Island reaches, a little less developed in those places. Um, and that's not a coincidence. Um, if you want to see them here, uh, you know, they do tend to be in, they are subtital and you're not going to, unless you wade out in the water, you're not going to be among it, but you will see it in the rack lines. Um, and, uh, and for those that want a little more information on the rack lines, we tend to get two of those daily because of our semi diurnal tides, which means we have two high tides, but one tends to be higher than another. And likewise with the low tides. But um, the, uh, the rack lines are where the, uh, one of the two tides comes up to. And you'll often find all kinds of things in this, animals and plants, including the eelgrass. So if, you'll, if you look through that and don't mind the smell a little bit, you can find some things that you might not otherwise see in these areas and, and know that, um, and, and certainly eelgrasses can be found there. I mentioned the wasting disease a little bit, which has been studied a little bit up in the North Sound. Um, seems to be associated with urbanization and, you know, which of course means stormwater runoff and stuff. Stormwater runoff is a big problem and there's been a lot of uh, talk, you know, you know, talks on that lately and, and efforts to get um, better stormwater bills in the legislature. Um, Seattle in particular has a lot of stormwater outputs. Uh, my father had mentioned when he was, was he, he was a University of Washington grad student uh, many, many years ago. He, he, had, he had been doing some diving in the Seattle area and come across it. And I can't remember her name. There was another diver more recently who's kind of uh, really um, put this out in the media about these, uh, these places where uh, these pipes that are just out in the, in the near shore environment that are just uh, releasing all kinds of things. So I think if, you know, these are, uh, these are things that are um, probably uh, will receive further study um, as some of these uh, wasting diseases, be, um, if they become more prominent, I think you're gonna see more study of this kind of thing. Um, I already mentioned that the eelgrass can contain epiphytes. These epiphytes like little, little algae and stuff um, serve it, can serve as food for uh, uh, plant, or sorry, food for animals that uh, live among them. Um, the, the, the seagrass itself is not really easily digestible by itself until it breaks down as detritus. And, uh, but, uh, but it does tend to contain the epiphytes. Also, the this, this eelgrass beds tend to have phyto and zooplankton in them because they tend to slow the water down. Um, and by doing so, um, it creates a place, a haven for uh, good food and food uh, resources for a lot of different species, um, both on the bottom and in the water column. Uh, here's the two different species, um, the native eelgrass, which tends to be there longer because they're in deeper water and uh, which means they need to be longer if they're going to be get high enough to photosynthesize properly. Um, they, they are bigger than the exotic uh, eelgrass or the dwarf Japanese eelgrass. Um, this is one that tends to be higher up uh, closer to shore in the mid intertidal. I've seen it, for example, at Tomy State Park. Um, it's, uh, it's, been a, it's been controversial. Um, some years ago, it was considered because it didn't really overlap spatially with the eelgrass. It was considered, oh, well, hey, it's providing some uh, habitat. Um, but the oyster growers certainly have been upset about it. Of course, they're, um, you know, they, they have, uh, you know, with, the, with their growing operations, they tend to like to, to clear these areas. And, uh, and so even though originally the Fish and Wildlife Service had considered this uh, kind of a habitat type species, it's now considered an, um, a noxious, quote unquote, noxious species because of the uh, oyster growers. So, um, 
that I would say that's it. Um, it's kind of a commercial rather than a biological de definition. The word noxious there. So, um, but in any case, um, the uh, these guys, the exotic eelgrass doesn't grow as big because they're in shallow water. They don't need to grow as big, and they can't grow as big. So. Um, Interestingly, uh, there's a lot of species in their evolution that uh, have come to resemble uh, the native eelgrass either by shape and or color. Um, the examples here I have uh, are on the left is the bay pipefish, down below is the tube snout, and the three spine uh, stickleback is up above there. But uh, these are all fish that um, live among them um, and uh, spawn among them and you know a lot of species including also uh, Pacific herring uh, put their uh, <clears throat> put their eggs on um, either uh, eelgrass and or uh, kelp depending on the species and uh, so these play these beds um, and particularly the uh, native eelgrass are, are important spawning areas for a lot of fish smaller fish uh, let's get on to the exotic species, the cordgrass. Um, there are there is a native cordgrass in California, the California cordgrass. But up here, no, we are not. These are not uh, native. And um, cordgrass that you see are from the Atlantic coast. Um, I should mention that a lot of the uh, you know you might ask, well, how did these species get here? You know, some of these um, plant species. Oftentimes they came with uh, commercial. Um, aquaculture operations such as oysters. You know, like if, when you're bringing Pacific oysters over from Asia, for example, you know, they, were, they would tend to be put in algae to sort of uh, keep them fresh and alive, you know, or, um, and, uh, and so not only were you bringing an exotic um, uh, animal species over here, you tend to bring the plants that they're uh, they're, you know, that they're uh, housed with on the journey over in the boats and stuff. So um, that's where some of these things came from. But uh, in any case, um, the cord grasses have been removed by the state uh, for many years now, particularly in the Twin Harbors, that being uh, Willapa Bay and uh, uh, <clears throat> Grays Harbor. But, um, and uh, and uh, that, that project has largely been successful. I mean, they haven't got it down to zero, but they've got it down to levels where they're not um, out competing native um, uh, <clears throat> seagrass and uh, um, seaweed species. And uh, um, the uh, cord grasses, they, it's, uh, it's basically, um, it's not as good for the waterfowl. I mean, the waterfowl like the native species for eating. And, and uh, so in general, this is something that, uh, uh, I, as an aside, many years ago, when I used to go to the, um, uh, the NOAA fisheries uh, conferences up in Seattle, uh, there was a researcher there that said, uh, oh no, it's, it, we don't need to remove them. It doesn't make a difference for the food web, but it actually does. Um, and actually uh, the data do show that uh, the, food, the aquatic food web actually changes depending on whether the cord grass is there or not. So they do have significant impacts. And, but this is a, definitely a success story for a, a cleanup. Um, it's not really been a big issue here in Puget Sound, at least not to this point, but it, on the outer coast, yes, it's been an issue. Uh, let's move on to uh, flowering shore plants. Okay, so these guys are, are up on, you know, they're, they're gonna be in the intertidal zone uh, higher up on the beach than the eelgrasses are, um, including the uh, exotic one. Uh, Pacific pickleweed is a popular species uh, that you see a lot right here in Olympia, for example. And uh, they're succulent like cacti, you know, because they want to hold water. Uh, they can be very salt tolerant. They need to be. They often live in areas that um, become dry for a lot of the tidal cycle and during that time they can get very very salty as as the water tends to dry up and they desiccate so if they weren't really salt tolerant they would die uh, but they are and uh, you can find them in lagoons and uh, such as at Tolmy 
and uh, here in Olympia along the shoreline. The, uh, they also actually have a woody stem, so uh, it's, uh, that definitely gives them uh, some support to uh, you know, handle the tides coming up and down. <clears throat> so the pickle weed, like its name suggests, does taste a little bit like pickle. It is edible, and some people consider it a delicacy. Um, and uh, it, uh, it is found you know, all along the Pacific coast here. This is, this is what should be uh, here. Um, that's the native species. Um, and uh, they're one of the, the pickleweed is one of the species that is definitely impacted by cordgrass because they tend to grow in the same areas. Mm. Uh, some other uh, shore plants. Uh, the uh, salt marsh daughter is that little orange stuff that's growing. It looks a little, it's sort of like a oceanic version of English ivy. Um, it is parasitic. Um, it means it damages whatever uh, uh, <clears throat> short plant that it grows on. And, uh, but uh, we do see it here. Uh, one that is, uh, has an uh, important function for stabilizing dunes is, is the silver beech weed. And uh, as you can see, that one's in flower there. Uh, it is one now, there, here's the, there's a rub of the, of the dune stabilization, for example. You want some dune stabilization because that's what has occurred naturally, but not too much. And we've had some uh, invasion, for example, of beach grass, which is more uh, bigger stabilizer than um, beach weed. And that has actually caused some negative impacts to the uh, native uh, dune um, flora and fauna. But you know, like a lot of things, you know, moderation is best. Silver beech weed is good at stabilizing, but not overdoing it like some exotic beech grasses. So um, any case, uh, these are ones that you commonly see. A uh, little bit on, on the zonation of the, these angiosperms or the flowering plants. Uh, again, it, it's a little, it's akin to the, what we see on the Atlantic coast, so not all the same species per se, but uh, you know, down subtitally, you've got the native veal grasses. As you move up into the intertidal zone, you start getting the rushes and the cord grasses, uh, cord grasses being exotic here in the Pacific Northwest, although you do have a native species in California. Um, as you get higher up, you start getting the sedges and, um, and also the pickleweed that we mentioned. Even higher up where it's more freshwater oriented, you're getting uh, you know, the cattails, the gum weeds, and as I already mentioned, the silver beech weed. And even higher up, you can get uh, sweet gale uh, or other shrubs. Uh, sweet gale is very popular and has been studied in, in the Skagit uh, estuary, for example. It's, uh, it provides structure and beaver associated with it and everything. So um, anyway, as, you know, in general, as you get higher up, the plants get you know, tougher stronger, um, more um, rigid, um, and, uh, and with um, a more wood content, you know, shrubs, of course, certainly have wood content. So, um, and a little bit, as I mentioned, for example, pickweed, but not to the same extent as shrubs. But uh, uh, so this is a general zonation. That picture in the background, by the way, is the mouth of Sequala Chu Creek. Um, it, uh, this was a place, not right at the time when I took the picture, but this is the place where I had seen lots of uh, sea lettuce at, at one time during the summer. And so, uh, and uh, that culvert is what leads to the creek. And that's a culvert, by the way, that, you know, it's one of many that you find along uh, Puget Sound that is smaller than it um, um, is needed for proper ecosystem function. Um, the, uh, that's one that, um, many of you probably have heard of the culvert decision that the tribes had pushed, Western Washington tribes, to get culvert replacements here, uh, in Puget Sound so that, you know, salmon can move up into these streams more. Um, and, uh, the Sequala True Creek, for example, is one of these places that did have more tidal influence, uh, before the culverts went in. Um, the, uh, the culvert agreement did not actually include the uh, um, the uh, railway 
the railways along Puget Sound. So, so there's, the irony is, is that sometimes you're getting good culvert replacement upstream, but um, downstream has still been an issue. Although fortunately the, the railways have been trying to work voluntarily with the state to, uh, to try to deal with these. So um, one good place here in, uh, right here in Bud Inlet where we've had a cul uh, culvert replacement um, is the um, <clears throat> Mission Creek, which is at Priest Point Park at the uh, southern end of that. And uh, that's one that didn't used to be passable. Um, and uh, they've got that functioning again as a, a proper estuary. And one of the things that you'll tend to ha see as it happens is some of these salt uh, macro plants will tend to uh, move up higher into the estuary as um, with better tidal flow. So, uh, um, so these are things that hopefully over the years we're going to see some improvements on. As we get some, and the smaller estuaries, such as this one at Sequala True, um, are called pocket estuaries because they're small. Um, but uh, if, as we're able to find uh, uh, funds to replace some of these culverts, we may see better eco uh, estuarine function and, uh, and it may help increase some of the abundance of some of the uh, macro plants that I've been talking about. So. Uh, and uh, like I mentioned, Mission Creek at the uh, southern edge of Priest Point Park is a good example of one that has been restored. So hopefully we'll have some more kind of those examples as the years go by. And with that, that is the end of uh, my presentation. Well, thank you, Bob. I do have questions. Okay. I'm trying to I'll go back to the title slide, I guess. And let's, yeah. Yeah, that's good. All right. Um. Um, is eelgrass uh, decline correlated with the railroad expansion and the hardened shorelines in the southern Puget Sound from early settler histories? And uh, does the Skagit have less hardened shorelines in comparison? Uh, I would say yes and yes, but let me give a little more detail on that. Um, the hardened shorelines have especially occurred in the central sound in the Seattle, greater Seattle area. And that's the places where we've really um, had problems with that. Um, I also mentioned though that the south sound tends to have the, has had the lowest eel grass densities in the past, although that some of that's now changing with restoration. But um, the, uh, so it's a combination of um, the pollution it's a combination of the shoreline armoring. We don't have as bad shoreline armoring down here as the central sound, but we do have lower eelgrass densities just because of some of the pollution and stagnation and, and things that are going on. So there's mu it's, you know, it's not just a one silver bullet on some of this stuff. It's, you know, there's multiple limiting factors. And, uh, um, but as I mentioned, um, the eelgrass tend to need softer beds. Once you start putting armoring in, it tends to create scour. And, you know, some of that, you know, those um, fine beds tend to get scoured away and that can hurt the uh, habitat that the native eelgrass does need. And so, yes, that is involved in it, but it's, it's not the only important factor, but it is one that, um, but it is, fortunately that's being addressed too. Shoreline armoring is getting to the point where um, we're not getting a net increase in that anymore. And in some places we're trying to, uh, the state is trying to, um, you know, actually get a net decrease in the armoring and, and replace the hardened armoring with a more what they call bioengineered solutions where you've got like logs, you know, chained in logs or um, things that are more natural and, and what the uh, Puget Sound historically had more of, you know, is, you know, logs, not necessarily chain per se, but um, the big logs are, are important in a lot of ways. They, uh, you know, they can, uh, <clears throat> they provide fish habitat, they uh, stabilize the shoreline uh, along with farther out the eel grasses that I mentioned, and, uh, and, uh, you know, a natural, you know, a natural system tends to look fairly messy. If you walk along Puget Sound and you come along and it gets hard to walk because of the logs and stuff, that's natural. That's the way it should be looking. And, uh, and, uh, and sometimes um, 
it'll, it affects the currents and it'll affect the plants and animals that lived around them. And uh, fortunately, as I mentioned, the, that shoreline armoring issue is being worked on. A, counter, a potentially counter um, to that would be some of the sea level rise. Uh, the city of Olympia, for example, has a proposal to, uh, you know, uh, increase shoreline armoring, maybe, uh, you know, wall off the waterfront, basically, if climate change, uh, the sea level rise becomes worse. And um, many of you probably know, historically, most of uh, downtown Olympia was part of the tidal habitat. And, uh, and, uh, and climate change wants to reclaim that habitat for the ocean. And uh, so that'll, it'll be kind of interesting to see how that plays out. But um, we, at this point right now, we're getting a net, um, we're at least not increasing shoreline armoring. Maybe we're gonna see decreases hopefully, but with climate change happening, um, that is a bit of a concern for uh, how, how well, how successful that reduction plan will be. And, um, but what we do know, um, for those that are, um, you know, know about freshwater or saltwater armoring is, um, <clears throat> is those have to be, if they're gonna be done, they have to be done carefully because um, if, if you don't make the walls high enough, uh, floods can go over them and cause worse problems. So, you know, all these things have to be worked out. Certainly the armoring has hurt a lot of the fish habitat. Uh, for spawning for forage fishes, you lose those, um, um, you know, the sand, Pacific sand lands and the surf smelt tend to spawn on beaches where you've got um, the groundwater seeps that I mentioned. They also, they, the logs and the overhanging vegetation help shade out and cool down the sand that they like to spawn in and find gravels. Um, and, uh, but once you get arming and that stuff gets scoured away, you lose your beaches and, um, and the rocky habitat is less conducive, you know, to their, uh, um, their spawning. And by doing so that those are important salmon foods too. And of course, salmon are important for the orcas, et cetera, et cetera. As you can see it, you know, all this, all these things have cascading effects and, uh, um, and, uh, so uh, um, one of the things that we have right now with the forage fishes, for example, is there's unlimited harvest, you know. So not only is harvesting a seaweed probably have an impact, but the harvesting of the forage fishes are having an impact that's, that may be cascading upwards. And that's something that may be something that um, um, will need to be looked at in the future as well. And, uh, but, uh, in any case, a lot of these impacts aren't just affecting just the plants or just the animals, they're affecting the whole ecosystem. Mm. Okay, so um, why are so many um, paleophytes also, um, also thriving in inland alkaline areas? Paleophytes or phaophytes? The brown, do you mean the brown seaweed? Uh, it's H-A-L-O-P-H-Y-T-E-S. Oh, oh. oh halophytes is in uh, highly salt tolerant things. Um, yes. And why are they, say that question again, sorry. Uh, why do so many paleophytes also thrive in inland alkaline areas? Ah, okay. Um, that's, a, that's a good question um, that I, I've actually done some work on. Um, they thrive, for example, like in eastern Washington, it's a lot drier than here, and uh, there's a lot more evaporation. So what can happen is over the summer, the wetlands can dry up a lot. And as they do so, um, sort of like what the pickleweed has to deal with as it, things dry up here on the coast, these plants, um, you know, and you get a lot of the sedges and rushes and all these kind of plants inland. Um, what will happen is, is as these, as that evaporation exceeds trans, exact evaporation exceeds, um, sorry, the precipitation. And at that point, these plants can dry out um, 
and uh, the water becomes more salty um, because of the concentration of uh, you know what uh, chemicals are there, um, and that also means they become more alkaline. So we have a lot of um, alkaline ponds in eastern Washington, particularly during droughts, and uh, they. Uh, <clears throat> It's, it really is a matter, of, as, I, as I mentioned, of the, the high evaporation that occurs. And, you know, the salts that you have in freshwater are a little bit different than the salts you have in uh, um, seawater. In, in freshwater, you get a lot of sodium chloride. Um, in um, salt water, you have magnesium chlorides and some of these other things. Uh, there's a lot more diversity of the types of salts. and um, and so it's a little different in terms of um, chemically, but still the, the, it's the same general thing going on. Uh, evaporation of water means the water becomes more salty. Um, but sorry, sorry, that's it's worse of a problem though in freshwater habitats that are that don't have as much buffering. Um, saltwater habitats, uh, you do you will get higher concentrations of salts in certain places. Um, but some of that has been artificial, like, for example, in San Francisco Bay, um, you may have heard that uh, they, you know, all those uh, in the southern part of the bay, they've had those really high salinity um, ponds that have been used commercially, and now they're, they're starting to restore them naturally. Um, so some of their salt concentrations were unusually high, um, especially if you start uh, having a lot of uh, water withdrawals from streams. Um, that's another factor. Uh, so, it, you know, uh, stream withdrawals can have effect on the salinity of the near shore. And, uh, um, and, and, but some of those salt ponds in, like I mentioned, in the southern uh, San Francisco Bay are now getting restored where, where they're, get, they're not going to probably be as salty. Um, and, and so the halophytes aren't going to be favored quite as much. But you know, basically what you're creating when you, when you get rid of the freshwater part, whether it be from um, uh, naturally or artificially, um, naturally in Eastern Washington, for example, though that's been made worse in some cases by uh, irrigation. In some cases, uh, the return flow from irrigation has actually helped things a little bit along that regard, but so it depends on where you are. But um, here in the South, um, in the southern uh, San Francisco Bay, for example, uh, those those salt ponds were had un unusually high salinities because of the um, because of the commercial production of salt. You know, for you know, for basically, you know, for for grocery production and stuff. So those are uh, so the halophyte hallow means basically high salt. Phyte, of course, means plant. Um, these are, you know. We've always had places naturally that um, become more salty and uh, with uh, desiccation and with uh, droughts and particularly during the summer. And, uh, and, uh, but some of those plants have been artificially um, made more abundant because of human impacts. Okay, I'm gonna do one more question uh -huh. and it's uh, related to the seaweeds. Okay. Can a hold, hold fast reattach itself? No. Once, it's, once, it, uh, once it comes off, the plant usually will just, um, the plant usually will just, uh, it'll, it'll just become part of the floating plants. Um, it, in the cases of like kelp, for example, that's, um, they, they might float around and, and, you, and you will hear about the, you know, DNR, for example, does study floating kelp as part of its project. Um, Ulva, the sea lettuce, for example, still photosynthesizes quite well, even if it's hold fast, uh, breaks off. But, um, but uh, you know, a lot of these plants will eventually get washed up on shore and, and eventually die. But while they're in the water, they may still photosynthesize, but no, they they cannot, once they, once, and like I mentioned, for example, the sea urchins, for example, might take out uh, the whole, you know, take out the stipe just above the hold fast. And at that point, the, the plants are gonna float away and, 
Um, it, the net productivity of the, the kelp beds will go down because of that and, uh, and eventually become barrens if, if, if the sea urchins, uh, you know, overpower the system. But uh, um, so, but initially, yes, those plants can still photosynthesize. They're not going to die immediately, but eventually they will get washed ashore. And once they get washed ashore, they, you know, they're, they're going to, when they desiccate to a point where they can't handle anymore, they, they bleach basically, they become white. And you may, you sometimes will see that as you're walking around. Yeah, that, those plants are not going to probably come back. They're probably, they're probably history at that point. So, uh, um, but no, they're, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a system um, where um, it's not, it's not, it's not like what happens on land where sometimes if the tree gets cut down, it, there can be re-sprouts. I'm not aware that happens. I will check to make sure on that, but I'm not, I'm not aware that happens in the, with the seaweeds. Okay. Um, I, uh, I'm going to do two more just because okay. to the Q and A and there was two more questions there. Um, uh, I remember up in Canada, I saw three or four deer feeding on seaweed and uh -huh. I'm wondering if that's common. Um, probably, yes. Um, <laughs> the, you know, there's a lot of nutrients and micronutrients in seaweed. And, uh, you know, think of it as sort of the shoreline salt lick, if you will. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of creatures that crave salt and, uh, and crave a lot of the nutrients that come with it. And uh, for that reason, yeah, it's probably a common thing. And, and, and to add to that as sort of a side, not only are they eating plants, oftentimes all these species are eating salmon carcasses too where they wash up. And uh, so everything from deer to raccoons to, uh, oh, and even, uh, you know, even a lot smaller creatures and vertebrates and stuff um, may be eating um, uh, the, the salmon carcasses, but certainly the vertebrates the terrestrial vertebrates like deer and some of the other ungulates, they often crave salt. And that's probably, that's probably more common than we even see, you know, but it, it's definitely happening. And, you know, there's a, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of the, you know, good nutrients, you know, that come from uh, seaweed, you know, these uh, trace elements like selenium or uh, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones. Um, um, I'm just drawing a blank right now, but um, they tend to be in higher concentrations in seaweeds. And so if, if, a, if for example, let's say a deer, for example, was, was not getting enough, to, you know, it was, it was a little bit um, uh, malnourished, for example, it might, that might be a good way to, for it to uh, restore itself is to go on the beach and get those, eat seaweed for certain. And they are, you know, those are herbivorous type of creatures. So, um, yeah, they, they have the, their, their digestive systems can handle that. They can actually digest some of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, did freshwater pond weeds evolve uh -huh. into marine um, saltwater seagrasses and eelgrasses? Mm, good question. Um, Hmm. I have to, I'm going to have to look into that one a little more. Um, I don't know if it was pond weeds per se. Um, some, you know, a lot of what you see, like a lot, pond weeds will look a little bit like seagrasses, but, you know, some, a lot of times that's a parallel or convergent evolution. And uh, I'm going to have to check on that one. But um, I mean, I, I think probably, I mean, my educated Yes, or my understanding is, is those, the seagrasses came more from grass-like things, you know, something more along, along the lines of reed canary grass, for example, although here in Washington, that's exotic, but um, as a freshwater type of grass. But, um, but some of those other creatures like beechweed and stuff, I mean, these, they probably came from a range of, cre uh, range of plants. Um, it's not like 
I don't think it was, it's not like it's evolution from one land plant to all these shoreline plants or, or, or sea and eel gra sea grasses, for example. Um, but the, the sea grasses probably were grass-like things. Some of those other things like pickleweed and beechweed, those are, those are, those probably came from very different types of land plants. So, um, but uh, I'll have to look a little more into that. I haven't, uh, I haven't studied that very much. Yeah. Great. Um, so um, I, uh, I really thank you, Bob. This has been like wonderful. I'm, you're getting lots of thanks. Um, you know, any of the uh, questions that maybe I missed or something or ones that you're gonna go back on, I can, um, I can um, put in the newsletter. So if you could just, yeah. you know, when, when you get a chance and you don't have to answer them all at once, we can spread it out over time. Um, oh. Yeah, just, I didn't put my email in here, but yeah. you got my email, so you can you can forward things to me. Yeah, yeah, and um, we'll just uh, this has been a really great, um, very insightful on um, the different uh, you know uh, regions of the uh, Salish Sea and the pl plants and uh, uses in that of those areas. So I really appreciate you doing this. Um, uh I am going to, um, I'm going to open it up, uh, see if I can figure this out, uh, to, um, so that everyone can kind of um, uh, ask, or, or we can talk a little bit, just because this is our beginning thing. Um, okay.